So at 17, I dropped out of high school and I moved to the beach to become a lifeguard. And ironically, that was the decision that turned me into a researcher, a professor, and a business owner in healthcare. Let me explain. So you have all the perks of being a lifeguard. The greatest is saving lives. And most of the rescues that we would make would be in these rip currents. And oddly enough, most of the victims that we would rescue were only a few feet from safety. They didn't understand the ocean. And just to their left or right by a few feet, they'd be out of that rip current. So we'd spend the day swimming into these rip currents, taking the victims parallel to shore and in. And on this day here, we had 976 rescues. This was our busiest day. I had 20 rescues. And as you can imagine, as a 17-year-old going home and bragging about it, it was a lot of fun. Now, we also had shore break to contend with. This was a lot less fun because at times you're up in your stand just kind of waiting and watching for accidents to happen because shore break is when really violent, vicious waves slam beach patrons right into the sandbar. You really feel kind of helpless. And in 1995, there was a day that I'll never forget. We got off our stands. We did something we had never been trained to do, nothing, something we had never done before. We warned everybody about the shore break. We just caught them out of the water and explained it to them. And from that point forward, we didn't have another neck injury. So in the first two hours, we had five people that had serious injuries. And then for the next six hours, we didn't have one. And I always wonder, how many people do we prevent from a life of pain and disability just by educating them? So I realized education is a very powerful form of prevention. So years later, when I became the lieutenant in charge of training all 200 of our lifeguards, I put the emphasis in training on education, prevention, and intervention. In other words, we'd first get off our stands, educate the public about the hazards in the area, and then we'd move them away from those hazards. And we were able to save significantly more people by making fewer rescues. That was the odd thing about it. We had a complete cultural change. Like if a lifeguard came home bragging about making 20 rescues or whatever in a day, the other guards would look at him like, what were you doing? It's not your job. So we really had a culture shift, and it made a big difference. So eventually I got my PhD, and I had to give up lifeguarding. Uh, but I didn't want to give up saving lives. As a passion of mine, I really wanted to focus on chronic disease. And in all the courses that I teach, which range from biochemistry, anatomy, physiology, nutrition, exercise physiology, these are all classes that I teach. In those classes, I try to put in information, applied information, about how lifestyle relates to chronic disease. Because when I look at chronic disease, I see a lot of parallels to those early years lifeguarding, where in many ways we're kind of sitting back, waiting and watching, as the dangerous currents of our lifestyle sweep us into these disease states. For example, if you catch a cold, you find out in a few days. If you catch heart disease, you find out in 40 years. So if we get to the root cause of these diseases and look at how lifestyle plays a role, we can slow this thing down, this chronic disease epidemic down. Where right now we're talking about over 100 million Americans that suffer from chronic disease, which represents 84% of our healthcare costs that are expected to rise to five trillion by 2025. And it's because in many ways, our healthcare system is a disease care system. Each of these individual diseases are being treated independently with a whole multitude of different drugs, all with different side effects. When in reality, they're all woven together around the way we live our lives, the foods we eat, and how much we move. So I feel honored to be able to teach exercise and nutrition because I feel that these could be the most powerful medicines of the modern era, if you really think about it. But we have to have a culture shift there, too. We have to realize in healthcare that these are, in fact, medicines. Like if you work out for 20 minutes in the morning, just some light exercise, 20 minutes in the morning, your blood pressure will be lower for your entire work day. But because we don't really think of it as a medicine, sometimes I hear, well, tomorrow your blood pressure will be elevated again. Well, that's how medicine works, right? You have to take it again tomorrow. Do another bout of exercise tomorrow. Take two if you need to. You know, and with diet, it's endless when we look at the effects of diet on, on health and how we change our diet lifestyle-wise. Because, like, for example, phytochemicals in plant foods have been shown to lower blood pressure. They also lower inflammation and many other things. And when we think of inflammation, it's a common thread across all of the chronic diseases linked to inactivity and poor nutrition. Our standard American diet, which is our SAD diet, fills us up with excess sugar and excess lipid, excess fat throughout our blood vessels, and it can damage our blood vessels unless we dispose of these fuels. The best place to dispose of those fuels are in our muscle. We should be mainly muscle. And we need to have enough muscle to store those fuels. 
Then we have to move our muscles around enough through physical activity to burn off these fuels and make room for more. You know what it's called when we run out of room to store sugar in our muscles? It's called insulin resistance, which leads to diabetes, which we expect one in three children today to develop in their lifetime. Okay? And that excess fuel builds up centrally in this deep fat around our organs called visceral fat. And that visceral fat gets oxidized. What that means is that it turns rancid and promotes inflammation. And when we have this chronic state of inflammation, numerous things happen, such as our blood vessels getting stickier, our blood more likely to clot, our cancer cells, which all of us have in us, are more likely to grow, and then our risk of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's increases. So we really have to understand how lifestyle can play a role in all these chronic diseases and address them as medicine. Let me give you an example. Cancer, across all cancers, there's a huge variation, but across all cancers, the average 10-year mortality rate is around 36%. Imagine the urgency that's created with a cancer diagnosis. If you or I were diagnosed with cancer, what we'd be willing to do to overcome it? Surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, arguably some of the most taxing things you could ever put yourself through in order to survive. Now, cardiometabolic disease, which affects one in three Americans, Okay, can have, in some instances, a similar 10-year mortality rate. For example, a guy in his 60s who smokes and has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, he has a 36% 10-year mortality rate. But for him, the good news is that it's not chemo, radiation that he has to go through. He needs to move around more, eat more plants, get outside, take some time to breathe and manage his stress. So I think education is an extremely powerful form of prevention, whether it was lifeguarding back in the 90s, you know, or today learning about chronic disease as a professor and researcher. And when I came to the University of Miami, I did the unthinkable. I turned down the tenure track that I was offered, and I wanted to focus on undergraduate education because I really believed I wanted to start with teaching our future doctors in exercise physiology, because I wanted to make it a pre-med major, I wanted to focus on turning our major from exercise phys, which it still is, but into a pre-med major, predominantly, studying nutrition and exercise and how they relate to disease. And our major used to have 10 students, now it has 250 students. Because the younger generation of future doctors, I think, really get it. If they want to get it helping patients optimally, they have to integrate lifestyle, such as nutrition and exercise, as future doctors. Now, the best way for them to learn is to do. So we wanted to have a good practicum, ex practicum experience for these students, and we created a pre disease prevention initiative called Guardrails. We called it Guardrails because these students were going to help uh, direct patients out of the dangerous currents of their lifestyle towards more optimal health. And what we do is we embed them right there in the, in the office, right there in the doctor's office, meeting face-to-face -face with the patients, giving action plans on nutrition and exercise, uh, so that they can see what it's like to sort of be a lifestyle doctor alongside conventional medicine. As the program grew, we wanted to streamline the process. I wanted to create some algorithms that could easily give evidence-based guidelines on nutrition and exercise and give people really specific programs as to what they needed to do to get healthier. So I gave the students a platform that had about 10 algorithms from an Excel sheet, and then it grew to a little bit longer where we gave them nutrition and muscle skeletal health and cardiovascular health, metabolic health, full report, wellness report, really. But then our program grew to testing 600 patients in South Florida every year. So our students are testing 600 patients on average in South Florida every year. So we had to scale this out. We had to grow this um, innovation here into one with over 100 different algorithms that help both the doctor and the patient have insights on lifestyle data and how the patients are doing in areas like nutritional indexes and cardiovascular fitness and target body weight or where they're storing their body fat and many, many other things. We even give very specific recommendations to the individual, how small steps can make big differences, like adding some vegetables to your day, taking a few more steps. And it's, it's sort of like being in a rip current and explaining to a person, of five feet this way, you're going to be safe. You know, subtle changes that can save their life. And it's great that we're able to bring this to 600 patients here in South Florida and make a little bit of a change. But if we really want to affect healthcare, we wanted to scale this out. And it's now used by a company, HealthSnap, this innovation, with over 300 doctor's offices across the country where we're testing thousands of patients. And in those 
offices and in those healthcare providers' systems now, the patients are being remotely monitored and their lifestyle data is being tracked. And then they can adjust care. They see clear benchmarks on how the patients are doing and they can adjust their treatment based on that. And then we figured this can also fuel research because we have data now from thousands of patients all across the country. So that data comes back to my lab and allows us to look at the efficacy of integrating lifestyle in conventional medicine. In addition, my doctoral students can study specific questions like how to combat neurodegenerative disease with special meal strategies and eating strategies. We have uh, a study where we're looking at remote patient monitoring and how we can reduce readmission rates to cardiac rehab. And we're also looking at preventing muscle atrophy in the elderly and how we can keep them out of a nursing home. And finally, you know, one of the things that we were able to see with this project is that universities have a unique power to affect positive change if they embrace the idea or the understanding that education, research, service, and innovation, they're not mutually exclusive. They feed off each other in an integrated way. Good research can fuel education, good education can fuel research, innovation, service, and that's something that can really help us affect change in an area, especially like healthcare that needs it so much. So I want to finish with a quote by Dr. Dennis Burkett. If people were constantly falling off a cliff, you could place ambulances under the cliff or build a fence on the top of the cliff. We're placing all too many ambulances under the cliff when you think of it when it comes to chronic disease. And as a lifeguard, I remember I was able to save more lives by getting off the stand and educating people and using prevention. Imagine how many lives we can save if we do it in healthcare. Thanks. Thanks.